Thank you for that historical backdrop, both that which occurred in Nazi Germany during World War II and how it uh, found its way and its usage uh, within the Jehovah's Witness here in the United States. And it found its way into the legal system as well, led by a, a legal team which included Hayden Covington, of which whose daughter is here. And one of the first cases of note was the Gabitis versus Minersville case. And to present uh, an illustrated presentation is Robert Zick, program co-producer and spokesman for the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witness. And they will be presenting from Gabitis to Barnett. Just, just mention we're really appreciative for the privilege of being here at the Jackson Center. Uh, we've worked with a tremendous staff professional, qualified, and really uh, such a pleasure to work with. Uh, of course, uh, Greg Peterson, who's the flesh and spirit behind uh, the activities here at the center. Dee Catman, who's helped open up an opportunity to actually speak to a wider audience, as well as all the work that Carol Drake and Cheryl have put into the program and caring for all the details. And of course, Ed Tomasini, who makes sure everything works smoothly and uh, you get a good program to look at. So we really appreciate all the effort. And for all of you that have come, we hope it's educational, and we hope it's interesting, too. And in that regard, I just want to draw your attention to the program that you received, perhaps, when you came in. Uh, on the back page, just to mention this briefly, on the back page, there's a little QR code link, and that'll take you to an area where you can download some information. So if you didn't get a chance to look at the panels outside, uh, you may not get an opportunity to do later. You can download those there together with some additional information. There's a brief survey, so if you have any thoughts, uh, what we can do to improve, what parts of the program you really enjoyed, please make a few comments there. They're optional fields, but it'll give us an idea of what we can do in the future if we have another opportunity. And if you are with the media, uh, you can always send an email to opi at jw.org, and we'll be happy to try and help answer any questions or get some additional information for you. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. Let's get started. Well, Minersville School District versus Gobitis. West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett. That's a mouthful. And those case names represented two very distinct but similar closely related legal processes basically two trials that were separated in time by about three years, 36 months, presided over by arguably the most powerful and perhaps influential court on the world stage. And that resulted in one of the most influential legal precedents for the free exercise of conscience in modern times. But aside from all of its legal significance, it really was about two families, spelled G-O-B-I-T-A-S and B-A-R-N-E-T-T -T without the E, families. From Gobitis to Barnett, more than anything else, really represented the story of four children, three girls and one boy. Now, there were other plaintiffs in the case, but you might say these children served as the poster children. And so in its most compelling aspects, this was really a story about children. So when did it all begin? Well, as was so well presented just previous to this part, uh, there were similarities with what happened with the Gobitis and Barnett family to a hurricane. And we've heard a lot about those recently, right? And the events leading up, much like a gathering storm, started sometime before World War II. We heard already how that uh, Hitler, with his penchant for conquering, created an environment in Europe which increased feelings of nationalism and sovereignty. Those feelings started to spread and eventually reached all the way to the United States. And of course, not coincidentally, a lot of young people were going to be called on to show where their loyalties lied. There was a massive difference, without question, 
between what was happening in Nazi Germany and, of course, what was happening in the United States. A lot of people aren't aware of this, but as you heard earlier, since Jehovah's Witnesses were sharing the concentration camps with Jews and many others during this period, for many years prior to World War II, they had been reporting about what was going on in Germany and what was going on in the concentration camps. And it came out in their publications, which were printed into the millions of copies in many languages. But of course, that information uh, wasn't of note at the time. However, aside from these very significant differences between what was happening in the US and Europe, there was a common element that was common pretty much among all nations of that time, and even today, a salute, a pledge of allegiance. Of course, we know that this picture is not Germany. That's the United States. And of course, while Jehovah's Witnesses believed that being a good citizen was part of their Christian responsibility, they felt that allegiance belonged only to their creator. So as nationalism began to spike in the lead up to World War II, this was about to create a real problem. In 1935, a witness by the name of Carlton Nichols in Massachusetts became one of the first witnesses to be expelled from school for not saluting the flag. And the story made headlines in the media. You might want to call that lightning strike number one. Now, the Associated Press, because it had reached a pretty high level of uh, visibility in the media, they wanted to get a comment from Judge Joseph Rutherford, who besides being a legal professional, was also a prominent member of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses at the time. So here's an actual recording of what he said in answer to the Associated Press about what had happened to Carlton Nichols. The saluting of the flag is making it an image of the power to which one looks for salvation. The attempt to compel children to salute the flag is positively wrong. If any person desires to salute a flag and does so, that is his affair and no one can object. But it means much to one who has consecrated himself to do the will of God. So it means much. Really, it was up to each individual to decide what their conscience would permit in terms of a salute. Lightning was about to strike twice. As emphasis on the flag salute was gaining momentum toward the end of 1935, Billy and Lillian Gobitis were also about to become the focus of intense pressure. But first, a little background behind the Gobitis family. Lillian and Bill were the oldest of six Gobitis children, born just two years apart. They grew up in Minersville, Pennsylvania, a small coal mining area similar to this one, just a few miles away. After Lillian's dad, Walter, had almost been killed in a mining accident, they decided to earn a living instead by opening a store. They called it Economy Grocery. A lot of immigrants lived in town, and the homemade sausage and kielbasa were a big hit. During the Depression years, many would buy on credit. If they couldn't pay, Walter would never go after them to get his money back. Of course, in Minersville, as in many schools around the U.S., the flag salute was gaining popularity as a way to teach children, especially immigrants, loyalty to the country. But as Rutherford explained in his comments to the Associated Press, Jehovah's Witnesses didn't quite see it that way. They viewed a vow of allegiance to a flag akin to an act of worship. So children of Jehovah's Witnesses began refusing to salute the flag in school. By the time Rutherford made those comments in 1935, little Billy was already in the fifth grade and Lillian in the seventh grade. Not long after, in early November of the same year, Billy decided on his own not to say the salute. The next day, my mom Lillian decided to do the same. So what happened next? We're thinking, who better to help us tell the story than a member of the Gobitis family? So I'd like to introduce uh, with me to the platform, Judy Gobitis Close, daughter of Lillian Gobitis.
Judy, I have one uh, very important question. Did you try the sausage? <laughs> I just knew that my grandfather could mis make the best steaks in the world. We tried to copy it, we could never copy it. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Well, it's great to have you. Thanks for coming all the way to Jamestown. My privilege. You know, this next slide, Judy, sort of illustrates the point that once Billy, your uncle, and uh, Lillian, your mom, made that decision, it was really just the beginning, wasn't it, of, of quite a long journey. So I thought maybe it'd be nice to actually hear from your mom uh, in an interview that she gave some years ago about how this all happened at school. You were both expelled at the same time. Yeah, I was in seven and he was in five. And did you uh, try to tell me about what you know about? He wouldn't salute him. Yeah. How did the teachers He respond? said, he said, he came home one day and said, I stopped saluting and. I stopped saluting. Yeah. It was kind of a declaration of pride. Huh? Yes, yes, yes. He said, the teacher tried to put up my arm, but I held onto my pocket. And she, she couldn't put up my arm, you know. And that, that was it. And I thought, oh my goodness, I have to take my own stand. I'd been kind of a chick, chicken before that. And so the next day I went to the teacher and said, Miss Schofstall, and, and I explained what I was going to do and why. And I, I was prepared for a recrimination. And she said, Lillian, oh, you are a dear child. Oh but not the class. When they saw it, oh, they were so angry at you, at me. And when I came to school, they said, here comes Jehovah, and the pebbles were flying. <laughs> but I didn't care. I, was, I wasn't that much of it. You never were moved to weep, cry? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not actually not. Um, I guess I was a little tough. I don't know. <laughs> Well, that was really nice, right? <laughs> so your mom was quite a character. She was, <laughs> but she, and she was, just truly loved being in school. Uh -huh. She was on the honor roll, she was even class president, and was very popular. And she knew that once she took the stand, everything was gonna change. She wouldn't endeavor to get that kind of role anymore, mm -hmm. and her whole life was gonna make a difference. She was making a significant crossover. Wow. So of course, when she made that decision, she had to write a letter to the school sure. kind of explaining her position in a respectful way. Yes. Uh, maybe you could read that. Okay. see it up here on the screen. These are my reasons for not saluting the flag. The Constitution of the United States is based upon religious freedom. According to the dictates of my conscience, based on the Bible, I must give full allegiance to Jehovah God. Jehovah is my God, and the Bible is my creed. I try my best to obey the Creator. Okay. So uh, it's clear from that it really was a religious basis. She wasn't, she wasn't doing that as an act of civil disobedience. Oh, absolutely not. She respected the flag and what it stood for, and she always stood respectfully, and it was simply the act of saluting that her conscience would not allow. Okay. So it takes a lot of courage. You know, we saw this picture, and, and I saw it in the PBS trailer on the program. Mm -hmm. Do you have a little information about what this is? The girl in red is my cousin Jana, Uncle Bill's oldest daughter. Okay, so this was many years later, mm -hmm. but it looks like it runs in the family then. <laughs> okay. Well, interesting. So when she made that decision on November 6th, someone else made a decision on the same day. What was that? Yes, the Minersville schools had no requirement or no rule requiring the students to salute, but that day the school board made one. Yeah. So this is what it said, that refusal to salute the flag shall be regarded as an act of insubordination and shall be dealt with accordingly. So is that what happened? Exactly. Okay. So basically, uh, she was expelled from school. And, and the reality of it was actually that there were many others, many other witnesses at the same time that were being expelled. And the media took note of that fact. Not only were kids being expelled, but the parents were being fined some were actually being arrested for truancy mm -hmm. because there's, their kids weren't attending school. Of course, they weren't attending school because they were expelled, but you know <laughs> how that goes, right? Uh, so there was a few uh, clippings. So the question is, what did your mom and the other witness, witness kids do then about their education? Well, they had to have, they were required to have an, uh, 
official educated teacher. So they set up what they call kingdom schools. And Lillian and Billy went to the school 30 miles away. And Walter, my grandfather, turned the delivery truck into a school bus. And op so people opened up their homes for them. Okay, so here's, here's, the, here's the delivery bus, <laughs> okay? So it was a store, you know, produce van. It turned into a delivery bus. And there's some of the kids in the school. Uh, here's some other classes that they had throughout that period. Um, you know, not only were kids being expelled, but teachers who were witnesses that didn't want to lead the flag salute for the class were also being fired, right? Yes, yes they were. So that kind of was a convenient opportunity. Now they were a, a teacher in one of these schools, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you get an idea. It's pretty widespread. Quite a few students went through this. So in February 1938, that's when your grandfather, your mom's dad, went to federal court in Philadelphia arguing that the school board had violated his children's First Amendment rights of religious belief and free speech. Now the school superintendent that was mentioned by um, the Bartisanos uh, strongly supported mandatory saluting, right? And there was a little exchange he had with one of the judges. Yes, Radabush said to Judge Maris, these children have been indoctrinated. They didn't think of this by themselves. But Judge Maris said, I believe they're sincere. I've watched them and I'm sorry. I believe they're sincere. Okay. And that was very important. You see, the, the fact that they weren't coerced by their parents into making this decision. Well, very interesting. That brings up an interesting period in this run up. Like a storm, there was this, this quiet or hopeful period when they were winning. They won two court cases, very significant court cases in their favor. But in reality, the storm was far from over, wasn't it? Yes, sir. So what happened on June 3rd, 1940? That's when the Supreme Court issued their ruling regarding the family. Okay. So let's, let's hear uh, your mom tell what happened. So one day, Mother and I were working in the kitchen, and Bill and Dad were downstairs in the store working. And there was a newscast in Washington today in the flag salute case, we said, ah, oh. there was a ruling of eight to one against Jehovah's Witnesses. You, you first heard about that on the radio? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Oh, we couldn't believe it. We ran downstairs to the store and told Bill and Dad they were equally aghast. And, and after that, that's when it was open season on Jehovah's Witnesses. Now let's go get them. That's what happened. Yeah, that's what happened, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they lost the case. So now a serious situation was developing. This is one, one newspaper clipping uh, that recorded that event. So, so when that happened, then, then uh, the rest of the storm was coming, you might say, right? Mm -hmm. They were in the eye, but now the rest of it was coming. So how bad did things really get between the time that the Gar Gar uh, Gobitis case was ruled on and, and until Barnett came along? Mm -hmm when the court reversed itself. Uh, this one quote, uh, Judy, from uh, Sean Peters, what did he say about it? He said it was, an, it was an unprecedented outbreak of religious persecution. Most people contemporaneously and subsequently have recognized it as the worst outbreak of religious persecution in the United States in the 20th century. Both my mom Lillian and her dad spent time in jail during that period. Interesting, right? So how old was your... She was like 11, and the people were outraged that they would take a little girl right. and put her and other little kids into jail. Wow. Well, she made friends, right? Yeah, <laughs> she, she had, had some, some lifelong friends still she friends made. With, right? mm -hmm. was, yeah, amazing, really, when you think about it. Now, you noticed uh, she was being interviewed by Phil Donahue, actually, mm -hmm. in those other clips. So let's hear Phil Donahue describe what that was like. We're at war. Americans are dying in the Pacific, European theater. You know what wouldn't, sal wouldn't salute the flag. You cannot overstate the contempt, the loathing that we had for those people. And when the Supremes said, you got to salute and expelled kids who wouldn't, over a thousand injuries. It was serious. Yes. Thank you, Judy, for you. spending the time to give us this little perspective on your story and your family. You. Appreciate it.
Well, after every storm, there's a calm. Now, some time would pass before the situation would change for, for Jehovah's Witnesses, but it did come almost exactly three years later. Something remarkable happened to bring that about. There, was a strong, there were strong indications, and we heard it in Bartisano's presentation, that the court was changing its position on this issue of the flag salute. And this meant that a majority might actually be in favor of a reversal if there was a new trial. And that opportunity came uh, in early 1942 when Gaithy and Marie Barnett were expelled from school. And Marie is here with us today, and she'll be speaking about it a little later. Now, their case was heard by the Supreme Court in 1943. By that time, public opinion and sentiment had already started to change and shift to some extent in their favor. In addition to Chief Justice Stone and Justice Jackson, four other justices agreed in a ruling of six to three that the conscience of these children should be respected. Uh, attorney Raymond Vesvari, who specializes in First Amendment and constitutional law, expressed the turnaround this way. So three years later, when the court seems to catch its breath and to see these ugly parallels, uh, it takes the dramatic step of reversing itself and saying, this isn't a country in which you can equate patriotism with forced allegiance to the state. This is a country whose whose constitution and whose composition intellectually is, is unique in that you can't equate patriotism with forced professions of allegiance. So the result is, of course, what we know now in the opinion, setting the majority view penned by Robert H. Jackson, part of which states that no official can prescribe what shall be orthodox or correct in politics, nationalism, or religion. People have a fundamental right to believe as their conscience dictates. Or in the down-to-earth words of Phil Donahue, and that's their faith, and that's their right. You can worship a pet rock if you want to, and no official, high or petty, can tell you that this isn't orthodox. Robert Jackson. Well, there are important lessons to learn from all this, isn't there? Number one, young people are often underestimated, aren't they? Where they often excel is in their sincerity and their moral clarity, and often their courage. Standing up for what's right is possible, even when the odds appear overwhelming. Personal integrity has its own reward. On that point, I'd just like to conclude with some final comments from Phil Donahue, who, in fact, would have liked to have been here but was not able to. To think that the Supremes came down from on high and it took two decisions, and they grabbed this little kid and they went like this to the nation. Stop right there. And they essentially, Robert Jackson looked over that bench and he looked at those kids and he said, you, this is what the decision means. You obey your parents. I mean, what's American to you? This is just one reason why I'm a proud American. And why, and why I respect the witnesses, not only for their courage, but what they did for all of us. Well, thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from Gobitis to Barnett. Gobitis to Barnett, June 14th, 1943, the decision comes down from the United States Supreme Court. The author of the majority opinion is Justice Robert H. Jackson. We have a center here in honor of Justice Robert H. Jackson. And to conclude the first portion of this session, I'm honored to introduce the grandson of Robert H. Jackson, Tom Loftus. Tom? Thanks, Greg. Justice Jackson has uh, many grandchildren, of which I am perhaps the least. But um, let me read from Justice Jackson's landmark opinion uh, in 
in the Barnett case. It was issued on Flag Day, 1943. First, some introductory matters. Following the decision by this court in Minersville School District v. Gobitis, the West Virginia legislature amended its statutes to require all schools therein to conduct courses of instruction in history, physics, and the constitutions of the United Nation of the United States and the state. Quote, for the purpose of teaching, fostering, and perpetuating the ideals, principles, and spirit of Americanism, and increasing the knowledge of the organization and machinery of the government. The State Board of Education adopted a resolution ordering that the salute to the flag become a regular part of the program of activities in the public schools, that all teachers and pupils, quote, shall be required to participate in the salute honoring the nation represented by the flag, provided, however, that refusal to salute the flag be regarded as an act of insubordination and shall be dealt with accordingly. What is now required is a stiff arm salute, the saluter to keep the right hand raised with palm turned up while the following is repeated. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Failure to conform uh, is insubordination dealt with by expulsion Readmission is denied by statute until compliance. Meanwhile, the expelled child is unlawfully absent and may be proceeded against as a delinquent. His parents or guardians are liable to prosecution and if convicted are subject to fine and jail term not exceeding 30 days. Speaking of the religious beliefs of Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, their religious beliefs include a literal version of Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, which says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that it is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. They consider that the flag is an image within this command, and for this reason, they refuse to salute it. There is no doubt that in connection with the pledges, the flag salute is a form of utterance. Symbolism is a primitive but effective way of communicating ideas. The use of an emblem or flag to symbolize some system, idea, institution, or personality is a shortcut from mind to mind person gets from a symbol the meaning he puts into it. And what is one man's comfort and inspiration is another's jest and scorn. To sustain the compulsory flag salute, we are required to say that a bill of rights which guards the individual's right to speak his own mind left it open to public authorities to compel him to utter what is not in his mind. The very purpose of a bill of rights was to withdraw certain subjects from the vicissitudes of political controversy, to place them beyond the reach of majorities and officials, and to establish them as legal principles, to be applied by the courts, one's right to life, liberty, and property, to free speech, a free press, freedom of worship, and assembly, and other fundamental rights may not be submitted to vote they depend on the outcome of no elections. To enforce those rights today is not to choose weak government over strong government. It is only to adhere as a means of strength to individual freedom of mind in preference to officially disciplined uniformity for which history indicates a disappointing and disastrous end. Lastly, and this is the very heart of the Gobitis opinion, it reasons that national unity is the basis of national security, that the authorities have the right to select appropriate means for its attainment, and hence the conclusion that such compulsory measures toward national unity are constitutional. Upon the verity of this assumption depends our answer in this case. 
Those who begin coercive elimination of dissent soon find themselves exterminating dissenters. Compulsory unification of opinion achieves only the unanimity of the graveyard. It seems trite but necessary to say that the First Amendment to our Constitution was designed to avoid these ends by avoiding these beginnings. There is no mysticism in the American concept of the state or of the nature or origin of its authority. We set up government by consent of the governed. And the Bill of Rights denies those in power any legal opportunity to coerce that dissent, that consent. Authority here is to be controlled by public opinion, not public opinion by authority. The case is made difficult not because the principles of its decision are obscure, but because the flag involved is our own. Nevertheless, we apply the limitations of the Constitution with no fear that freedom to be intellectually and spiritually diverse, or even contrary, will disintegrate the social organization. To believe that patriotism will not flourish if patriotic ceremonies are voluntary and spontaneous instead of a compulsory routine is to make an unflattering estimate of the appeal of our institutions to free minds. Freedom to differ is not limited to things that do not matter much. That would be a mere shadow of freedom. The test of its substance is the right to differ as to things that touch the heart of the existing order. If there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. If there are any circumstances which permit an exception, they do not now occur to us. The decision of this court in Minersville School District v. Gobitis and the holdings of certain per curiam decisions which preceded and foreshadowed it are overruled and the judgment and joining enforcement of the West Virginia regulation is affirmed.